Welcome to another exciting episode of Coffee and Radio. I am Heartthrob Rob, and joining me today is Ryan Wambacher, bass player of Bleeding Through and Light the Torch. How are you doing, brother? Good, man. Good. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on the show. Uh, Light the Torch has just dropped their new single, Wilting in the Light, off the album You Will Be the Death of Me, coming out uh, June 25th via Nuclear Blast Records, man. I love it. I think it's amazing. The stuff you guys have been putting out is freaking incredible. What's what's been the reception for you guys that you've uh, heard so far? Because I mean, it just came out six days ago. Yeah, yeah. It's it's been a lot of waiting around, and uh, everything just dropped the other day. So, with everything going on in the world, we have no clue. This is a first for us releasing a song and a video with no tour to back up advertising, and but uh, it's. It's been interesting. A lot of kids are around. They're at home. Mm -hmm. So, you know, digital, any kind of digital platform, I think, is kind of blowing up. It's kind of the the way it is right now. (laughs) Absolutely. It's really different. I mean, we've never experienced anything like this in our lifetime. You know, you go from touring and being on tour all the time and, you know, being around, feeling out records, and then all of a sudden it's nothing for a whole year, you know? And now that things are slowly starting to open up, you're just like, let's flood it. You know, let's hit them with something hard. And everyone is really liking the new stuff, man. But if you don't mind, I'd like to start at the beginning, if that's okay with you. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you get into, you know, you know, what kind of music did you listen to growing up, and how did you get into starting to play bass? Let's see, I'd say musically, I, I started getting into music uh, in general as a really young kid. My mom uh, was a stay-at-home mom until, like, middle school, and she'd be cleaning the house listening to Sabbath, Nugent, I mean, uh, <laughs> I distinctly remember like the Zeppelin albums laying around and a bunch of other stuff and then you know country music like a little bit of everything so I got my taste from my family Uh, my sister was really into music too no one played any instruments or anything like that and uh, I think around seventh grade I had a friend uh, that played bass and I kind of was into it so I just started I, I went on let's see I think I got on my 14th or 15th birthday I got a bass and just kind of started winging it started with uh, punk rock stuff Dead Kennedys Misfits and then once I heard heavier music that was the end of that yeah for sure or the beginning of the end <laughs> everything went downhill from there <laughs> no that's very cool man I mean right off the bat like you're into punk rock and I mean when you discover something new like that it's just like oh my god your mind opens you know you're used to what your parents play your sister yeah. and then all of a sudden something like that opens your mind up to something new and I liked all the angrier punk music so as soon as you you know when you're 14 years old and you see a CD in flames that says hate breed on it uh-huh. you're gonna check it out and there used to be a place in Irvine called CD listening bar you give them your ID and they would set you up with a CD player and you can just pick CDs all day there was no time limit really cost money I don't know I mean you, I guess kids would end up finding something they like and buy it I mean it was a good way you could like demo CDs before you bought them yeah and that's how I found like so many of my original punk and hardcore that I got into just seeing album covers and be like that's a cool skull why not uh, that's a smart idea you know like yeah. I don't think there's places like that exist that's anymore think, you know that's why I think album covers serve like such a, a huge purpose I mean it's the art form that catches your eye to what you're listening to it's two different formats but one is trying to get you to listen it's the cover of the book Definitely. Right? You, Definitely. You, you, yeah. Let me judge this book by its cover, you know? I, mean, I like books with pictures. So. <laughs> so you always got a good picture. Okay, so you're in high school, you're picking up the bass, you start playing punk rock, um, you know, slowly but surely, you know, w- were you in bands before you hit, like, yeah, high school bands, or when did you start doing that? My first band was, how old was I? I think I was 15, 14 going on 15. I used to get dropped off every Wednesday on the other side of town with a buddy of mine. And uh, he had just moved to the other side of town, and he, there was a kid playing drums down the street from him. Uh-huh. And we started a band. And then we found, I think, uh, our, our buddy Mike. He was in a drama class or something. And we started. <laughs> it was a pop-punk band to start. And uh, I barely played bass. I was the worst person in the band to start. And just like I, But I played with everyone that was better than me, so... I've always played with people better than me. That's the only way I've gotten better is just trying to keep up. That's my way of practicing, I guess. Steel sharpens steel, man. you got to be around people that are better than you. Okay, so, you know, as things progress even farther now, 
Bleeding Through was formed in 1999. You joined in late 2002? Yeah. Somewhere around yeah, there? Some, right, somewhere around there. Right after Portrait of a Goddess? Is that yeah. when you get, yeah. you get there? Yeah. So I, I graduated high school, and then a summer goes by, and I'm getting ready to go into school, and I got a buddy of mine who knows some of the guys I'm Bleeding Through, and um, their bass player at the time was also playing in 18 Visions. So... When you get both, when you're playing in two bands, it's hard to tour with both. So they gave him the ultimatum: hey, you got to pick a band. And obviously, 18 Visions at the time was bigger, so I came in as the fill-in guy, and then eventually took his spot. <laughs> that was around 2002, 2003. Okay, very cool. So that's right when you guys do the trust kill thing. That's uh, yeah, a little bit after that. I think I was in the band for just shy of a year before we started recording. We, I mean, I joined <clears> the band. My first thing was like two back-to-back -to -back tours as a fill-in, but I got the gig before the tour was op over, and it was just hit the ground running. I had never toured before, and then I toured nonstop. I think we toured like nine, ten months out of the year f up until, you know, we went on hiatus, broke up, whatever you want to call it. Now. <laughs> yeah, we'll get there for sure. I mean, you get there, and it's the iconic photo shoot with all you guys lined up, you know, uh, for... Uh, this is love. This is murderous. You know, Brandon's holding the heart. Yep. You know, that thing is like, you know, I was that age, you know, where I'm in high school. This is the fucking new cool fucking thing for me. You know, this was like people's MySpace backgrounds and stuff. This mm -hmm. is this era. You know, what do you remember of that photo shoot? I actually, I remember, let's see, I remember the, uh, there was a lot of white paper and we're not like a white paper band. Uh, we're always doing photo shoots on backdrops that are grungy looking at walls or whatever and, and they we saw the concept for the artwork and we thought it was really cool having the white backdrop but I think that's the only time I ever shot in front of a white backdrop ever and I, that was the first and last <laughs> it was cool though man that was like a cool little statement obviously you know you come with that's like an instant classic you know back mm -hmm. to back off of the other one yeah you see it and you kind of know what it is if you're into the music oh for sure like Orange County Hardcore, like, was revamped. You guys, you know, as Bleeding Through, 18 Divisions, Throwdown, like, everything you guys were doing was just crazy in those years, you Orange know what County I mean? Orange County held it down for a long time. OCHC, baby, Orange County Hardcore, that's how we crazy do it. Crazy how many bands came out of Orange County. There's the late 90s Orange County scene, you know, but mm -hmm. then, like, you guys, like, revamped it. Like, it was alive and well. The punk scene before that in the 80s. Oh, of course. And 80s. Fullerton was popping, you know, over here. Man. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it was it was crazy times. So as you're going along, you're touring off of this album, right? And is, I mean, you said you're there for maybe two years or whatever at the time. Is that when the van flip happens? Yeah, so we were on tour with As I Lay Dying. And Brandon's so good at remembering. <laughs> if I were to call him right now, he would know exactly what year, what month. What like, day. It's, it's, it's crazy. But uh, yeah, so we were on tour with As I Lay Dying. We're about... I think it was 2003. Four, yeah, yeah, it's probably, it was late 2003 because it was winter time. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, we get to, we're leaving Utah, going to Colorado, and that's when we hit Black Ice on the bridge. And that's pretty much like, that's when like everyone's like, oh, this happens in your <laughs> life now. That, that canceled that whole tour. That was the longest we were home after that accident. I think that we were home as a band for years because that tour continued on, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then we were going to Europe after that. But it was still starting at the same time. So it was crash happened. We were stuck in Salt Lake for like four or five days, uh, just crashing on people's floors. And then got the van fixed enough to drive it home. Mm -hmm. Like plexiglass pieces where the windows were drilled into the... Yeah, and it smelled like rubber adhesive all around the windows, the silicone. Like it is... And everyone was like... What, every time it was your turn to drive, it was just like white knuckling. Like everyone's just having flashbacks. Oh my God. I couldn't even imagine you guys crazy. jumping back, dude. Yeah. You guys are crazy. You guys were in Sinai Beach's van too at the time? Yeah. That sucks. Sorry, guys. <laughs> crazy times, man. But I the mean, cool I've... thing, I will say though, a cool thing about those dudes, uh, you know, we, we use their van. We, we don't crash it. We total that thing. <laughs> uh, and we call them to tell them. Oh and my it's God. just like, hey, it's like when you're, your dad lets you borrow their car for the first time to go like on a date and you <laughs> screw it up like we're calling them we're like hey man so we got in a crap we feel really bad and the, f the only thing they said they're just like are you guys alright 
That's cool. That's the only thing they said. They didn't care, so I got to hand it to those dudes. I haven't seen those guys in a long time. They've broken up, man. R.I.P. to Sinai Beats. That was an amazing band, too. I used to run into them occasionally at shows every once in a while, but life gets busy. I've seen you guys at Chain one time. You guys play over mm-hmm. there one time. That was pretty cool. Um, in 2004, you have the, the Glass House DVD, which mm-hmm. I thought was amazing. Um, what are your kind of memories from, hey, we're going to shoot a DVD? Um, initially, it was really, really cool. Um, I never really thought I'd get to do something. Every time something new comes up when you're in a band and you get an option to do something, it's kind of like you never really think that's going to happen. So especially when you're young and it's happening the first time, mm-hmm. it's, you get really stoked. As long as you make smart business decisions, you know, you can just go with the flow. So it was, everything just kind of went, went, went. But the setup for the show, we had the soundboard and everything, and we knew the show was going to be really good. So it was kind of like... You don't you don't really realize it's being filmed. It's there's always kids filming and stuff like that. So it wasn't like that like big of like a head fuck or anything. But uh, it turned out cool. The uh, a lot of people don't know, but the very beginning of that DVD, the audio is from the record for the first like minute mm-hmm. because when the show started, the pit opened and it hit the soundboard and knocked the sound out. Oh, really? So the first minute or two of the live performance is actually the audio from the record and then it blends into the live show that's cool that's cool but yeah honestly i don't really remember much of it It was just kind of like another show but just like a really really good glass house show and i think we managed to ask them to get the barrier to be pushed up to the edge of the stage as opposed to a gap Mm -hmm. so there was more stage diving and stuff like that that's cool man do more that to to look back and i mean you get things immortalized, you know, as they're on camera, you know, people can look back at their home videos. You can look back and be like, damn, here I am 15 years later. Like, oh, like yeah. you know, look at back, like, look how popping this was, you know, we're still going. It's cool. I had hair. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm right there with you. Um, you know, in 2004, you guys are hitting OzFest. What are some OzFest tour memories for you? Oh, man, that was, that was the first uh, tour bus experience we ever had. Um... We managed, no black ice on this one. No, <laughs> uh, we managed to break down th- in three different buses, two or three different buses before we made it to the first show of Ozfest. So we barely made it to the first show. There was like a pre-production day where you get like a really quick sound check, and then they they save it in the control bo- in the soundboard. Mm-hmm. But we weren't there for that. So our first show of Ozfest was literally like put your gear up there and go. Oh my god. Yeah, it was. I don't know. Bleeding through always managed to get things done. I don't. I think we've maybe canceled one show in our entire lives as a band. Really? Something like that. Good for you. Yeah. Um. So it was just chaos from day one. But the, one of the cool things was uh, we played second stage, and all the second stage the buses are all just parked together. You're kind of near the crowd uh, where the parking is, so mm-hmm. it's kind of craziness happens every once in a while. People going through the buses, but. Um, every night was like playing CeeLo with Slipknot and just like riding around golf carts and like it was us Lamb of God, Hatebreed, Slipknot and then that Ozfest was basically like Orange County hardcore and there was us and Throwdown and uh, who else was on there that we knew and there were other bands that we had toured with a bunch um, Unearth every time I die. So like was we, it Dice today on that one? No, I think that was the next year actually. Mm, yeah, no, they weren't on that one. But so we'd all toured like numerous times together. So now it's just like oh Ozfest, we all know each other. So second stage, like the majority of bands on there, like we already knew each other. <laughs> and then all the Slipknot dudes and Lamb of God and Apri dudes are always been super cool to us. So it was just a barbecue every day. It was it was touring a summer camp for adults. There you is go. what it is. So you can't say otherwise. You, you, you got to do some work, but for the most part, you get to do what you want. That's cool, man. And then, I mean, great memories to even like be like, damn, I played Ozfest. I go from oh, yeah. listening to Ozzy to you know now I'm playing, you know, playing this festival. That's got to be a crazy feeling. Um, Ozzy every night. That was crazy, right? That was crazy. 2006, you guys come out with the truth. That same year, you played The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, right? No, 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 no. Not that one? No, we never did. Oh, okay, sorry. See, look, that's, that's why right. I can't listen to walk- Wikipedia. That's right. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I'll, I'll just start putting stuff in there. Uh, yeah, you make it whatever you want. Whatever you want. Work it like hot dog on a stick or something. 
<laughs> there you go. The Truth was also an amazing album too, though. Like I loved that one. You guys come back in two thousand eight with Declaration, mm -hmm. but it seems like maybe things are getting tired of you and the relationship between you guys and Trust Kill at the time. Well, we were done <clears throat> before Declaration came out. We were all done mm -hmm. physically and emotionally with that record label. It just wasn't serving its purpose. I guess we always felt like we were touring really, really hard and not seeing anything from it. I mean. Hardcore was still more DIY back then than it is now. I mean, there's a lot of things that, you know, you didn't sign anything for, you know, who who knows who's, where the royalties are going and stuff like that. You know, you weren't splitting percentages and everything like that. But, uh, yeah, by the time Declaration came around, we, we wanted out, and it was an option. That record was an option, and he took it, so he owed us for it. And I think we finished that whole record before we we were supposed to get paid before we left to go record that record and we drove all the way up to Vancouver without getting paid yet borrowed money from a manager Ryan Downey at the time uh, I think uh, our singer's dad we borrowed money from Marta like friends like we borrowed money to get that that record started and we didn't see any money from the label until we had finished and we were all home I flew back a little early for uh, a family member's birthday after I was done with bass tracks and vocals, and like we still hadn't seen any of the money. So we were days away from it. I think we were going to put it out on the internet for free, and no one in our genre had done that yet. And looking back, I really fucking wish we would have done that, because we didn't see much money from, like, I mean, there was never been a huge payout. It's hardcore music. I mean, it's you do it because you love it. And there's just you can do it for a living if you try hard enough but you really have to constantly tour so I really wish we would have put that record out on the internet for free it would have been different man you guys would have been a yeah. year ahead of the curve it's you know like you said hardcore is just like such a niche audience as much as it is metal or yeah. punk rock like it serves a smaller subsection of that you know mm -hmm. um, and it seems like maybe at the time you guys had outgrown trust kill or whatever you know or, we were just ready for something new yeah you know you outgrow it something bigger and better things you know mm -hmm. but you would have been years ahead if you would have released it like that but you know at least the people got it at least there wasn't this big old f you on the blogs like yeah. you know what i'm saying like you yeah. guys just fine motherfucker here accessible. you go you yeah can order it exactly like here you motherfucker shelf it i know bands that happen at major labels and the label just says fine screw you and they just shelf you it's yeah. hard to find your record anywhere yeah we didn't deal with any of that thankfully let's put you on the shelf for three years and then you guys can go record something <laughs> Well, at least you, you get out of that, and, you know, 2009, is it Rise Records then for mm -hmm. the self-titled in, mm -hmm. you know, in 2010? Uh, let's reintroduce ourselves. Let's get back out there. I feel mm -hmm. like that's what it is, right? Yeah, we were kind of on a second wind on that one. <clears throat> we got in Dave Nasty in the band. Uh, it was uh, Suicidal Tendencies, Infectious Grooves, mm -hmm. no use for name. Um, he was awesome. I really liked touring with him. He was older than me. He'd been doing more music than I had, so, like... I don't know what do you, you know when you when you got guys and bands that are older than you not just a few years but like you know five to ten someone who has experience that can give you pointers kind of thing you're like I think I even talked to him when I joined Light the Torch as W you know like asked him like what I should do or something and he gave me pretty good advice just do it till you can't so I think uh, having him in the band kind of refreshed stuff he brought solos that wasn't a big thing in bleeding through and until it, the declaration ish era. And then the next record after that, that's when Dave wrote a handful of songs on the record and did that one in New York. And that was, uh, we stayed in a house next door to the studio mm -hmm. and it would wake up in the morning and cross the driveway into the studio door and then back in the house all day. Yeah. And it was just cold and snowing. Man, it was weird. It was a good time though. Steer crazy, but it gets you, you know, yeah. popping. And that, I mean, that, that, I think that record kind of sounds like the situation we were in. It's kind of cool. Is one of the fewer times that we that we um, fly somewhere to record and stay. And a lot of bands they do stay local. Sometimes I love the fact that Light the Torch is done in L.A. You know, you can go home at night and stuff like that. But uh, it was cool being in a different place. And it's all you wake up in the morning. There's nothing to do, so you go in the studio and you work. Absolutely. And you know, like you were saying earlier about you know um, the other guy helping out. You know, with mm -hmm. things. It's nice to have someone who's been around the loop. Mm -hmm. who you know you can pick their brain and see what they really have like seeing like hey man you're not only seeing like 
giving me advice of what could happen, right? You've probably met or known people that have date made these decisions yeah. and lived with them five or ten years now and been like, hey, you know what I should have done or this really helped me, but I need a little bit of this. Mm-hmm. And he's there for that kind of uh, advice, which I think is very cool. Um, you have The Great Fire in 2012, which I think mm-hmm. was an, another amazing album. Um, how'd you like that one? That one was the first, let's see... That one was when Bleeding Through became really busy individually, everyone. That was like when we knew things were starting to slow down. Everyone was super busy. Trying to book tours was really hard. Every, I mean, you got to get six people's you know, schedules to line up. Brandon's got a gym to run. Derek's got a family and a job. Brian's got, I wasn't sure if he had a kid coming on the way at the time, but he wasn't touring with us anymore. Uh, that was the first record that songs were written with not everybody in the same room at the mm. same time. That'd be like a couple people in the room at a time. Um, no, no rehearsing of songs like in an actual band room. Because we come from the era of you show up for band practice X amount of days a week. Sometimes it'd be four or five days a week. And you practice for four or five hours. Write songs. You memorize everything before you leave. And then everyone goes home and works on stuff the next day. We came from that era, and this was the first time where, like I would show up and it'd just be me and our producer, Mick, and it'd be like, okay, I'm going to do the bass lines over the song, or I'm going to I have an idea for a vocal melody, I'm just going to put it down, and then when Brandon gets here, whenever, uh, he can work on it or delete it or change something. That was a lot of that going on. That was the first time. So it was very different, but that's kind of what you do now. So it was like getting used to doing that. Yeah, I mean, things change a little bit. I feel like everyone grows too you know mm. it's just harder to put things together like you said um and i think the next year is kind of when the the breakup happens the hiatus the long weekend whatever you want to call it yeah we were um like i said it was really really hard to get everyone to book shows together and it just i mean we started the band fuck, i think the youngest person in the band was like 19 and now we're all into our 30s people are having kids people are getting married so lining stuff up and it just got to the point where it's like can't do this full time we're not going to um other people have interests and you know uh people are moving i think uh marta had moved up north already derek lives out in the desert it's only like two hours away but uh yeah it was uh, it was along the times where trying to get something booked and everyone could do it but one person couldn't or two people couldn't do it this month but the free this month and someone else and i i can't remember i think it was brandon that said it first but it was kind of long lines he wanted to focus on the gym and everyone was kind of on the same page at the same sense but obviously I was still wanting to tour I mean I literally have not stopped I I joined Devil You Know before Bleeding Through was over so it was uh, I would say looking back at it it's definitely more of a hiatus we had every intention of coming back and when I mean that I don't mean as a full time band it was just uh, like a hobby like we're done as a full time touring band like we don't do this for a living anymore we have our own lives but we still love doing this we don't want to stop just because we can't make a living doing it so we're all you know financially individually financially responsible for ourselves so if you got time to do the band cool let's keep doing it and kind of right after that record is when it happened and it's kind of we still hit each other up and write a record and is what it I mean that's what uh, uh, the last record was was pretty much a, we wanted to do a record for fun we're not done doing it we just don't do it full time anymore there's nothing wrong with taking a little break you know what I mean 